get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, many more, how they overcome big challenges in life and business today. I'm very excited. We have Caleb O'Dowd, who's one of the top direct response marketers. Caleb worked for three years shoulder to shoulder with the late Gary Halbert, a man widely considered one of the greatest direct response marketers and copywriters of his era. Caleb then moved on to start his own direct response business in the nutritional industry where he's created large volume marketing campaigns across multiple channels, which we will talk about. He and his brother John started multichannelmarketing.com where they help direct response companies optimize and grow their businesses in multiple channels such as direct mail, magazines, newspapers. He's bringing back magazines and newspapers online and more. Now, if you're listening to this, this is actually a very rare opportunity because Caleb stays under the radar and he's sort of like the mafia because you hear about him, but you never really see him. And I want to thank Sam Markowitz because probably if I didn't know Sam and Sam didn't introduce me, Caleb would never talk to me. So Caleb, thank you for joining me. <laughs> thank you very much, Jeremy. I appreciate we it. We got you out of hiding. And you know, I always like to include a fun fact because you're just in the trenches doing it. So you don't have time to talk to people and, and actually teach it. But there's some rare stuff that you're doing now, which people will check out at, at the website I mentioned. But... I always like to include a fun fact. You have so many fun facts, and one of them is you lived in nine countries in eleven years. Um, yeah. So, what country? Where have you? What's been your favorite places? You know, I get asked that a lot. I, every place that I live is, you know, is uh, is really interesting to me. Otherwise, I wouldn't live there. But uh, you know, definitely New York. Living in Manhattan was a lot of fun. Melbourne, Australia, was great. Um, Tel Aviv in Israel was awesome. So, uh, yeah, a lot of places. Are and you there. go places so to learn certain things, which I find interesting. You went to Israel and you basically were studying and training Krav Maga. So what did you learn with that? Yeah, Krav Maga is like a, a, a form of military uh, martial arts in the Israeli army there. So I was there for a year. I had a really great trainer who was training the, the special forces there. So... I spent 12 months getting beat up on a regular basis there. It was a lot of fun. So, uh, yeah, I'm, martial arts is one of my big passions in life. So I, uh, I've moved to a couple of places for martial arts reasons. Yeah, and I'm, I want to talk about the current one where you are. You're in the Ukraine now. But, but back to the – when you moved to Israel, I found it fascinating. You delivered cookies. Tell me about, <laughs> tell me about that experience. Why did yeah, you do that well, and what was it? War broke out in Israel at the time, and, and uh, there was missiles uh, coming in from Gaza almost every few minutes. And uh, my trainer there at the time was a great guy and uh, very big on charity and and uh, and helping people out. So there was a lot of children in underground bunkers at the time hmm. um, in a city called Ashdod, which is very close to... Uh, Gaza, where a lot of the missiles were landing, and mm. they had spent just days underground in these bunkers, just hanging out while the bombs were landing. Wow. And uh, my trainer said to me, "Hey, we're going to go deliver cookies and and Coca Cola and all that kind of stuff to these kids. You know, um, if you want to come, I'm not asking you. If you want to come, let's go." And I was like, "Let's go! Brilliant!" And it was wow. it was an amazing experience. Yeah. yeah. What was surreal. it like? What was it like going into those bunkers with the kids? Yeah, it was very strange, you know. I'm an Irish guy, so we don't kind of <laughs> we don't uh, we don't have bunkers in my city in Limerick. So it's uh, <laughs> That's a good. very strange experience to yeah. even be in neighborhoods where there was a local bomb shelter, you know, where uh, people were living underground while being you know missiles were landing every five ten minutes. Um, so it was a really unusual experience, but a real 
lovely experience, you know, like a real kind of human experience. Everyone in those bunkers were so delighted for us to come. They knew that, like, what we were doing and they knew the risks that we were taking and yeah. we understood the life that they were living and it was just a very humbling, very nice, you know, spine-tingling uh, experience yeah. there. So it was uh, really one of those moments that... Um, I look back on and feel really positive about yeah. How dangerous was it when you were going to these bunkers? Ah, I mean, they're, know, they're firing missiles and you're like, I'm going to go deliver cookies. That seems dangerous it, to me. But. It, it, it sound, yeah, I mean, it, it was obviously dangerous. I mean, there was missiles mm. landing. So, I mean, these people weren't hanging out in bunkers for the fun of it, you know. There mm. were missiles landing quite regularly. Um, I didn't, there were missiles going over us, but there were none landing around us while yeah. we were there at the time. So, yeah. but it was, it was a common sight to see missiles yeah. coming over us. Yeah. You know, Caleb, you have just such an amazing journey. You know, and this is just like a small portion, like from, from Ireland to delivering cookies in an Israeli bunker. Like who would, would you have ever thought that? What did you think you were going to be when you grew up in Ireland? Oh, I don't know. I had no idea, but I didn't think I was going to be a copywriter and a direct response marketer. That's for sure. It was not on the. Uh, <laughs> it was not part of the plan. But uh, life is interesting. It can take you to strange places, you know. Yeah. So, what was it like growing up in Ireland? Ireland, yeah, yeah. Ireland is, is cool. You know, I mean, I got out of there as quickly as I could. The weather isn't so good, so I left when I was uh, twenty. Actually, I quit school when I was 16. Mm. I, didn't, uh, <laughs> I wasn't a big fan of, of, of school, so I quit when I was 16. My dad said, hey, if you're going to quit, you know, you're not just going to quit and do nothing. If you're going to mm. quit, we want you to kind of become a carpenter. So mm. I became a carpenter. I became a qualified carpenter, actually. Mm. I, at 16, I started into a carpentry career and mm. realized pretty soon thereafter that it wasn't going to make me the uh, millions of dollars that I wanted and give me a, a life of, of travel and adventure. So I, uh, I knew quite quickly into that career <laughs> it was not going to be the, uh, where my future would lie, you know. So my, my brother John actually, uh, you know, would send me, he lived in America at the time, and he would send me kind of books on personal development mm. and success and business and making money and all that kind of thing. And uh, I guess through reading those books, as a, as a late teenager, I kind of developed a, a, a passion and an interest, slowly but surely, uh, in, in marketing and, and business and, and all that kind of stuff. So, Kill, Do you remember some of those books? Like what were some of the influential ones you remember from what he sent you? I think, you know, I, there were so many books. I think uh, Think and Grow Rich. Mm, it was a classic, really, yeah. Yeah, it was a classic, but I, I mean, I, I, one tactic in that book mm. uh, did change my life, wow. for sure. Um, and it, it kind of led to how I got in the door with Gary Halbert later on, but there was a story in that book of, uh, and I don't really remember, but I think it was Thomas Edison, a guy who wanted to work with Thomas Edison. He mm. had no skills, no experience, no uh, qualifications, but he kept on writing to Thomas Edison all the time, telling mm. him, I want a job, I want a job, you know, I'm coming to your work with you, I'll be the greatest employee you ever had. Mm. And just via relentless communication and mm. overwhelming enthusiasm, uh, Edison just caved eventually and the point of the story was this is a great strategy for getting a job <laughs> and uh, so when I uh, eventually got turned on to this crazy guy called Gary Halbert via my brother John yeah. um, I, used, <laughs> I used that tactic pretty much to get in the door yeah. with Gary so what'd you uh, do? yeah I mean I, I just literally called up at the top of his newsletter at the time there was a telephone number and I just I just called and it went through to his assistant Teresa and uh, I just you know applied that lesson hey I'm this guy from Ireland and I would love to come and learn from Gary I want to be the greatest copywriter I want to I want to do this I want to do that and she was like well he's not really looking for anybody he doesn't need any help right now <laughs> but I just kept at it and kept at it and kept at it and I, I, I think I eventually tormented her enough that she gave me <laughs> his actual uh, house phone yeah. and I got through to him and I, I spoke to him and 
he was like, no, I'm not really interested. I don't need anybody right now. Thanks for calling. Don't ever call back. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so and you I called just, back the next day or what did you do? Yeah, I just kept calling back. I kept leaving him messages, sending him emails. And uh, eventually he just snapped and he was like, listen, I'll give you three weeks if you stop harassing me. I'll give you three <laughs> weeks of my time, but I'm going to charge you an arm and a leg. And uh, this training isn't free. Yeah. Uh, so if you want to come all the way to Miami from your little town in Limerick there, you got to send me a huge amount of money. And uh, <laughs> I'm only giving you three weeks. And essentially the message was, you know, go away. Don't, don't, con don't, don't contact me again. I'm tired of these phone calls. So mm -hmm. um, actually I got the money. It was my brother, John, again, my, uh, my, my, uh, the was guiding. Was it an arm and a leg? Was it an arm uh, and a leg that he was charging you? Yeah, it was a huge amount of money. Yeah, it was a huge amount of money. And my brother John paid it. And uh, it was maybe the best decision or at least one of the best decisions that mm. that uh, he and I made. <laughs> primarily he, primarily mm. John, because he was, he was paying the money. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and very much to Gary's surprise, he got the check. And could not believe it. He was like, "I can't. I just can't." He thought that would deter you. Yeah, he thought that was that was his way of saying "go away," you know, because he mm. had said "go away" so many times, and I didn't listen. So he gave me this huge roadblock, thinking like that would be that, and uh, and thankfully that wasn't that. And I turned up in Miami <laughs> for three weeks of training, and. Uh, yeah, and the rest is history. Yeah. I so, what convinced you so much that this is you need to jump through all these roadblocks, pay all this money, and get to the U.S.? What was it that you saw? Uh, lifestyle, I think. You know, I, John and I really started into this whole entrepreneurial business because we wanted a lifestyle. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. we went through that whole phase of I want it billion dollar business and I want all and eventually you know the reality that I think everyone is really searching for at the end of the day at least I would like to hope you know that people would be thinking in, in this way is that they they're looking for a life of, of freedom mm -hmm. you know freedom to go where you want buy what you want do yeah. what you want pursue your hobbies pursue your passions you know help your friends and family achieve what they want for themselves um, so for us, it was lifestyle. It was, it was freedom, and uh, we had looked into a lot of various, you know, different means of making money, and eventually we got sold on the idea of of direct response marketing, remote mm -hmm. control marketing, automated selling, make more money, uh, make money while you sleep go to bed at night and wake right. up rich in the morning. You know, right. that's the secret to wealth. Um, yeah, and that's why we got into it. And uh, Why you know, Gary, though? What, when did you first discover his information? Yeah, it was John that discovered him, actually. Mm -hmm. And John printed out some of his newsletters and brought them over to the house one day. And he was like, hey, you got to check out this guy. And... Uh, I had just never read anyone like him before. Mm -hmm. I'd never read anyone right like him. I had never seen that kind of personality shine through the written word. Mm -hmm. And I was totally captivated by him, totally enthralled by um, his personality, his education, his how he presented himself. He was just a no BS guy. Right. He wasn't afraid to speak his mind. I just, I, I gravitate towards those types of people. I yeah. enjoy them so much. Um, and I just became convinced. I don't know, just something inside me became convinced that yeah. this was the guy, uh, you know, that I wanted to learn from. I think, I think having, I've, I've had many mentors. I still have many mentors in many different areas of my life. And I think that, uh, the concept of, of having a mentor is enormous. And I think that for, you know, I, I think, as, you know, for that to be an approach to life, to have a, a relationship mentor, to have a business mentor, to have just mentors across all of the important areas of your life is just a huge, huge uh, 
means of 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 uh, ensuring that you're living the most rewarding life possible. So for Gary, something just clicked. I just I just realized mm. something about him. I knew we would get on together. I I uh, so I just decided to pursue. Yeah, it. yeah, and just something you knew it was the right decision. You know what I find when I was doing the research, and even Gary comments on that you're such a hard worker. Where does that come from? What did your dad do? Yeah, definitely came from my dad for sure. My dad was a very, very hard working guy. Um, he had his own business and uh, was just always, uh, just always working. Yeah, he was kind of you know one of those traditional men. His job was to get out there and. What kind of break. business was it? He had a, a contract cleaning business mm -hmm. in Ireland, so. Um, he was just always on the go, working mm -hmm. a lot of hours a day, um, working all the time. Just always saw my dad <laughs> on the go, bringing people to certain jobs, collecting people from jobs, pulling, dragging. Uh, so I, I guess that kind of that uh, it was ingrained in you from, yeah, from it seeing him. Came ingrained in me, yeah, yeah. The other thing then as well, I got into like construction. So you know, another part of my family. Are uh, you know they're they're big into construction, and uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, how should I say it? Uh, there's a lot of manly traits associated with working very hard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> among, among this genre of people in Ireland, you know, the Irish are known all over the world, especially for construction, to be like the hardest working. You take guys. pride in working very hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, if we take pride, we just do it, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. I, so I, you know, Caleb. So Gary said in this one interview, you know, he actually said Caleb is a hard worker, and he goes on to say, you know, he may sometimes see me as mistreating him, but I perceive it as teaching him. <laughs> what were some things that? that he was teaching you that looking back it really helped but at the time you're like why is he making me do this <laughs> <laughs> i uh i i you know i think that he was a brilliant teacher mm -hmm. um i think he understood that it wasn't just about uh like it wasn't just about sharing information mm -hmm. It was about understanding the ways and means of relating to a person and, and mm -hmm. giving that training so that training is received in the best way right. possible. And he was not afraid to. You smile because uh, there's a good story behind some, this. Some yeah. dark avenues to get his <laughs> points across. So, uh, well, you know, I, I uh, yeah, I mean, working with him for the. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, for I would say the first two years anyway was very tough because uh, actually the the whole time I was working with him I had no social life, no girlfriend, <laughs> no extracurricular activities. There was it was just pretty much nothing but working for Gary Halbert that entire time. So um, what was that like? What's a day like that you can't have a social life, you can't have a girlfriend, you can't do anything but just engulf yourself in this. Yeah, it's tough. You know, it's tough. He he. Uh, when I was working with him, he was very much a conveyor belt of projects. You know, there we were never working on one project. It was always like six or seven things on the go at any one time. There was mm -hmm. always new projects coming in on on top of on top of existing products uh, projects. You know, he never refused to check. So <laughs> if someone had the money, the the deal was on. You know. Um, so it was, uh, and he was a pot, he was, a, you know, he was an extremely in demand copywriter. So just an awful lot of work, just an awful yeah. lot of research, an awful lot of learning, an awful lot of, of writing back and forth. You know, I did, a. he would write a headline and I would write the ad, I would bring it back to him and he would give me no further direction. It was back, forth, back, forth, back, forth across several projects per week. Mm. Uh, it was just a lot, you know, it was an awful lot of work and, uh, yeah, so just a lot of work, yeah. but he was, he was, uh, he was tough, you know, he was tough. He was, but what did he do that was tough? Like, give me an example of something you can't say, cause it sounds like 
when you use the word, there's some dark things you're going to do. Maybe some you can't mention, but um, one well, that you... I can't mention, but I, oh. you know, I, I, I thought at the time that, like, I remember thinking at the time, like, I was very confused by some of his actions. But as I look back on yeah. it now, like, I really do think, you know, there was tremendous genius mm -hmm. in some of the things that he would do. Like, for example, so I was a carpenter, you know. Yeah. So he would go out. Uh, this is just one example. He would go out, you know, and he'd be like, hey, I'll be back in a couple of hours. I want 25 things done by the time I return. <laughs> I was like, okay, cool. And he would, came back with like a hammer, you know, like a, like a carpenter's hammer, you know, like a roofing hammer. Right. And he would put the hammer down on the table and he would say, uh, in a few months from now, when you have totally failed on all of your commitments <laughs> and you have internalized how much of a loser you really can be <laughs> and you're back hammering nails in Ireland, I mm. want you to look at this hammer and mm. think of the opportunity gotcha. you messed up. <laughs> so yeah. it's like, what? I can't believe you said that to me. And uh, but it drove me that yeah, kind of like the motivator. Yeah, yeah, and actually he, he uh, uh, you know, Gary became so that sounds rough and it was rough, but actually we were like best friends and uh, you know he was like a, he was like a best friend, a, a mentor, a kind of a father figure at the time, and uh, you know I had like a very amazing relationship with him but he was not afraid to push buttons he was not afraid to uh light fires under your ass on a regular basis and mm -hmm. as i look back on it i realized that like he got the most out of me yeah because of these things like he knew how to get the most out of me so sometimes getting the most out of someone is not always like a pleasurable experience it's right. not all uh, <laughs> it's not all cotton wool and, and sunshine, you know. Right. Um, but he got it out of me, and I'm I'm very grateful. And as I think back on it, as I said, you know, a great teacher will not just share information. A great teacher will will take the time to understand your psychology and figure out what is mm. the best way right. in which you know you can learn, or or the best ways to get the most out of you at the time. So I don't look back on that with uh, yeah. with any sort of disdain or distaste. I look right. back on and, you know, and admire him for yeah pushing uh, you yeah yeah i mean and he was a master of psychology he was a master of 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 uh human <laughs> psychology and and how people thought and worked and he was an engineer of that stuff i mean he was able to literally engineer you know massive action from mm -hmm. people and uh that alone, I think, is a great lesson. It's, it's certainly not something that I have <laughs> been able to apply in my own life with some of the people that I'm trying to influence. But uh, yeah, he was he was great in that way. Yeah. So certainly. Caleb, you yeah. arrive in Miami. You pay a, a lot of money. You come over yeah. from Ireland. Uh -huh. You think this per this is this is the person that's going to help, but you don't you don't know what is going to happen. What? So what do you start doing when you get to Miami? Uh, I didn't even know what he looked like. I didn't. I actually never even wow. see. I, at the time, there was like a kind of a like like a cartoonish type image of him on on his website, but I never really had seen a picture of him mm. even. So, um, <laughs> the first day that I met him, actually, I called to his door. I knocked on his door, and there was like no no answer. Um, so I'm like knocking, I'm like, I know this is the address, you know, I have the paper, I'm like, I know this is the address, so I'm knocking, I'm knocking, and uh, and all I hear is like <laughs> this grumbling and groaning inside, <laughs> inside the apartment, and the door swings open, and before me is this, this, like, caveman-ish type image <laughs> of like a guy in a leather Harley Davidson bandana with like a t-shirt uh, on. Uh, he's in a pair of underpants. He's got one sock on and he just looks like he's got one eye open. Like he just woke up from the couch oh, God. <laughs> and I'm like, Hey, who is like, I'm Caleb. Are you Gary? He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah come on in. Um, and that's how I, I, I first met Gary. I walked into his 
apartment and it was like stepping into the uh, a laboratory of a of a crazy scientist there mm. was like sales letters thrown all over the place there was products you know that he was selling everywhere there was headlines tossed here there and everywhere um and uh that was my introduction to what was about to lay ahead for me. So, uh, you know, what was on that day, he told me, you know, um, I'm going to spend an awful long time writing in the next few weeks. Yeah. And, uh, and he was absolutely right. I, I spent hours and hours and hours and hours every single day writing, handwriting out ads, headlines, Gary was a big believer in um, writing out winning ads. Mm. So he thought that, uh, he believed, and I, I believe it too, that when you write out uh, a, a masterfully written ad by a master copywriter, mm -hmm. that you internalize a lot of the uh, intuition and strategy and thought process mm. that went into that ad. Um, he was a big believer in that. I'm a big believer in it still to this day. So I wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote mm. and wrote and wrote <laughs> and just continued to write and write and write. So my uh, my job at that particular time was just to write out ads, write out ads, write out headlines, write out every last element of killer ads. He would just give me new ads every day. And I would write them out and write them out and write mm. them out. And slowly but surely, it kind of evolved mm. from that into bigger, um, <laughs> bigger jobs associated with each project. You know? Yeah. So, Caleb, what was one of the winning ads you remember writing that you're like everyone should write this out over and over? Um, you know, actually, no one knows about this ad. Um, <clears throat> and it's a it's it's a sales letter that Gary wrote for a stock trading system, mm -hmm. and I I really love it. I think it's probably one of the best examples of who Gary was as a copywriter. And I wrote that out so many times. Mm -hmm. um, no one knows about it. It's not out there. Uh, you know, it's it's Gary had this um, like a street, like he had this analogy of like street fighting. He was a street fighting copywriter, you mm -hmm. know, he would, he, you know, <laughs> he would, he would, uh, his form of writing was like muscle writing. And uh, when he wrote in that way, when he had a project that allowed him to write that way, that's where he really shone. So that ad, um, <clears throat> for me, it was a, uh, I think it was like a 20 page sales letter. It's wow. a really long one to write out. <laughs> You're like, here, write so, this a hundred times today or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it was a brilliant, it's brilliant, it's brilliant. I have it somewhere, I need to go and dig it out. That for me was, was brilliant. John Carlton's ads, I think, are should be maybe the foundation for every starting copywriter. Why? Because it's very hard to see a lot of psychology going on in VSLs, <clears throat> every one of John's ads, um, at least in, uh, you know, I, I actually haven't even seen anything of John's in the last few years, but all of his golf ads, all of his mm. uh, beat em up ads, they're just loaded with just about every, like, you know, tactic, tip, trick, and technique that you can shake a stick at. And I, I mm -hmm. think that like sales copy at the end of the day is primarily about that. Uh, particularly, you know, newspaper ads, particularly direct mail. Um, it's very, it's harder to see it in VSLs because a VSL is more of a conversation. It's more of a, more of a fluid, lengthy dialogue. But in direct mail, um, where you don't have the ability to, to like to talk like that because uh, paper <laughs> printing costs money um, you right. have to be very tight and even more so in newspaper ads so you really are forced to strip away all you know words that don't belong there and, and, and everything in your ad your ad should be a psychological minefield there should be no word no sentence in your ad that does not have a sales trigger in it yeah. and, you know to I guess it, for somebody starting out to really understand what those sales triggers are, 
uh, I would say that John Carlson probably and and a couple of more guys, Eugene Schwartz, Gary, um, and another guy called Ben Suarez probably are the easiest people to learn that those psychological tactics from um, and and sales strategies. So. Yeah, I wrote out a lot of John's ads. I wrote out a lot of uh, Gary's ads. Um, actually, it was primarily Gary and John's ads at the start. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Caleb, you know, <clears throat> I'm going to get into newspaper advertising because you're quietly killing it and um, you're going to be probably teaching a few other people, um, lucky people on, on that front. But what? Go, still with the stock trading system, you know, most people... I mean, this is not out there. People don't know about it. What was powerful about that newsletter that you remember that you can talk about specifically? Um, everything, you know. <laughs> I mean, there's a whole – we could talk for six hours on that one ad alone. Everything. I mean, you know, he – if you ever read his newsletters – you immediately become bonded to him as a person. Mm-hmm. You feel like an affinity with him. You feel like, you know, you, you know him. You feel like you know him. You feel like you trust him. Um, and I think within like the first six paragraphs of that that sales letter, he had conveyed that. And, you know, there are a very, very small number of reasons why um, ads fail any message fails and one of the primary ones is that uh, you just don't trust Mm. like the the person who's writing to you or the company and I just thought that within like the first six paragraphs he had overcome that perfectly Mm. Um, and he did it in 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 such a uh, (laughs) such a Gary Halbert way um I'm, I'm trying to remember it like by memory now and i i i uh, i just don't have the verbiage right yeah uh, but uh it was just a brilliant ad brilliant ad exactly targeted to the you know the the prime wants needs desires wishes of his market it was muscle writing i think he said like you know uh, at the very end he was like look if you don't if you if you don't think that this is the best product um you know <laughs> that that uh, that you've ever seen, or something like that, or if, like if uh, you must have a serious mental <laughs> or emotional, uh, you must have something seriously mentally or emotionally wrong with you. And it wasn't it like it didn't. It, yeah. You know, I'm giving you this text out of context. You know, I'm giving you this right. Text out of context he, he built it's trust so throughout the whole thing because yeah. of everything that went before it and it was an absolute blockbuster i mean so he wrote he wrote like he was one person to another person yeah. and that kind of like even in vsls you can see it today there's very few people that can that can convey that you know like like it's a real person that's mm. talking to you as opposed to a voice that's talking to the masses right i think a lot of vsls today you know they come across as a voice talking to the masses mm. um gary really made you feel in in this particular ad and in a lot of his other sales letters and ads that you were that you knew this person you trusted this person you had an affinity with him mm-hmm. um Ben Savenga is also one of those copywriters that can convey that kind of thing. A lot of people say that, like, the cause, one of the big reasons for uh, his incredible career is, uh, you know, and and his incredible skills is that he makes a friend of you before he sells you anything. Yeah. Um, By the time you, it comes for him to sell you something, you already trust and believe him, you know? Ben Savenga is just kind of like the, you know, the, the uh the great neighbor next door you know he's, he's kind the of nicest like the guy elderly, yeah. yeah the elderly nice guy that has yeah. everyone's best you know interest at heart gary didn't kind of have that vibe, <laughs> but, <he had laughs> that vibe but it was essentially the same thing yeah. you know so uh yeah i love that ad there's there's several ads that i yeah. that i really love and i really enjoy and uh that's a gem you know caleb talk to one person that you said that you know i think oftentimes we forget that and we're trying to, you know, we're just talking to everyone, and that that's 
you know, I'm glad you said that because that. Uh, that's hard. Yeah, and it's a little deeper than that too. It's like mm -hmm. putting your personality in there. Mm -hmm. You know, very few people know how to put their personality in there into an ad, and therefore they can't do it. You know, um, and it's uh, it is a true skill. I mean, it, it is, and it's a unique skill. There are very very few copywriters, even among the A listers. Even among the top A-list copywriters, the creme de la creme out there, even that's a rare skill among them. Mm. You know. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned, yeah. you know, obviously trust. Why ads fail? Trust is huge. What else? What are some other reasons that you see ads fail or falling short? Yeah, um, I mean, it's 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 you got the wrong USP. You know, you're selling something nobody wants. Uh, actually, you're selling something nobody wants is the biggest reason for failure. Um, you know, proof and credibility. I mean, I, I, I live and die by proof and credibility. Proof and credibility, if you get into it, is a philosophy for your career. It's, they're not sales tactics. It's it, it like, you know, there's a lot of sales tactics, you know, urgency, you know, uh, all of these different sales tactics. Mm -hmm. Proof and credibility is an entire philosophy for your approach to this business. And I think, you know, I think that maybe that's the first time it's been said. You know, I, I, I've i never heard anyone say that, but I, I live and die by that. Mm -hmm. Everything I do, I approach from the perspective of, of conveying proof and credibility. Product selection, market selection, you know, everything is, is it all comes down to proof and credibility. Mm -hmm. If you can, and it, so the winning formula for success is, you know, USP plus proof plus credibility. If you have a product that is exactly what your market wants and you're able to convey that benefit to your market and you're able to back it up by proof, that you're able to prove that your product does exactly what you're saying it will do mm -hmm. and then you have credibility, you have people, you know, third party, uh, like in the health space, it's doctors, it's scientists, it's medical researchers, you know, all saying that, like, you know, backing up that your proof, um, you're, you have the recipe for an absolute blockbuster, a breakthrough in conversion. There's no other means of generating a winner today that can trump that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's just, there isn't, you know, mm -hmm. it, it, why, you know, like in the past, I think that, like, you know, you could, you could sell a lot on pure emotion. Um, I think it's very hard to sell that way today because the level of, of skepticism and disbelief and distrust is so high that where the breakthroughs in conversion are coming from um, these days is is just via the route of, of proof and credibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, that goes back to kind of what you're saying with trust. You know, that having that proof and credibility just puts trust through the roof. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, trust is a form of proof. Yeah. It's a, it's it's a different type of proof. Trust in that sense is more like relationship trust. Um, but you can absolutely it's it is a form of proof. Yeah. yeah. So um, yeah. I mean, people don't buy because they don't want what you're selling, or else you haven't conveyed that it's exactly what they uh, want, mm -hmm. or else they just don't you know they don't believe that what you're promising it will do. Yeah. Uh, Will actually do, or else that there's just there just isn't enough credibility around. There's no reason to trust that that uh, that what you're you're trying to sell here is real. Yeah, and Kelby, you know, like when you have a finalized sales letter, a yeah. lot of time, energy, and effort goes into that, and it probably goes through a lot of revisions. Yeah. Can you talk about that proof and credibility component, and maybe how it started in one of the the sales letters? And then how you improved it or added to it to what the final version was. Uh, because you probably start off, I'm assuming, with whatever draft you have. And then you kind of just improve it, improve it until it gets to the final version, right? Um, no, I don't do it that way no. at all. How do you do I, it? You know, I think one of the big things that... I learned from Gary, and it took me years to actually learn it. I saw him doing it, but yeah. I, I never internalized it. Was uh, you know he would he would 
he would uh, commit to writing an ad in 30 days. Mm. And he would sit down and write the ad on like day 27. Mm. <clears throat> you know? Um, and the point is that like the writing process is the end result. It's the last phase. And it should flow out of you like water because you have done all of the research. So he would spend 26 27 days, 26 mm. days researching, finding like, you know, mm. everything he needed to, to find and then positioning everything in his head in terms of like where this is going to go, where that's going to go, where this benefit is going to go, where that benefit is going to go, where this proof element is going to go, what, you know, like he, he had it all um, mapped out in his head. So these days, especially with uh, newspaper ads, you know, a newspaper ad is really, you know, max a full page ad. You could probably squeeze 2000 words into it more commonly. It's 1500 words. Half page ad is 800 words to a thousand words max. So, uh, these days it's, it's more like putting a, a, you know, the, the, the pieces together. Um, hmm. I, uh, so like, I know where my proof elements need to go. I know where my credibility elements need to go. Um, so they go in those sections and then I, I, you know, I, I edit and optimize and polish those sections. Um, ultimately I think that's the best way to go. You know, the biggest mistake that I have made and 99% of copywriters make is that they think that they're writers and they're not writers at all. Mm. And they think that like writing a good ad is all about the writing and it's not, it's, it's, it's like 5% of the equation. Um, 95% of being a copywriter is like psychology, research, mm -hmm. um, you know, psychology, research, investigation, and and piecing the 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 selling process together it's yeah. all set, you know so the writing phase of it really is the last and you know uh it's not the most like i mean it's it's like it's not the most insignificant but i mean you should have everything you should know exactly what you are going to say you should know exactly when you're going to say it and you should know where everything is going to go in your sales message before you sit down to write. Mm -hmm. If you don't, I really feel that you haven't figured it out. You haven't mm -hmm. done your job properly. A lot of people are in like their hope based copywriters. They just hope it's going to work. They have no basis to like believe or to assume that what they're going to do is going to be successful. Um, and if you're, if you're, it's very easy to know whether you're a hope-based copywriter or a real salesman, uh, you know, and you can you can understand that very quickly by just asking yourself, do I really hope that this is, am I hoping this is going to work or do I know, or am I wondering how great it's going to be, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's like what level of success is this going to have? That's, you know, it's, that's what a, a real <laughs> salesman is asking himself. He knows it's going to be successful, just doesn't know how mm. successful it's going to be. Right. Um, but yeah, writing, if you're spending more time writing than, than yeah. reading and, and, and uh, researching and, and piecing everything together, then you're on the wrong yeah. track. Kelp, okay. thank you for making that distinction. You know, because research is uh, ninety percent of it or more. What was a time where you remember in your research you found you like I've got it. This is what I was looking for with the proof and credibility. So, like, keep people can see an example of what what that proof and credibility, like the the ultimate proof and credibility, looks like. Um, for a whatever a product or ad yeah it depends I mean there's different as I said you know proof proof and credibility come in a uh, infinite number of uh, variations across an infinite number of products and markets you know so like you know the same proof element mm -hmm. in a uh, a heart ad, you know, selling a heart health product is not going to be this, the, the proof element you would use in an investment advisory newsletter, you know. Yeah, so yeah. you have to understand what proof right. is and what credibility is. 
Um, a great Wait, talk example. Talk about a health one, yeah. Well, clinical studies in health. Um, you know, anytime you have a clinical study done on, on something, if you have uh, <clears throat> a prime example is uh, I was working on a project recently where Harvard University did a clinical study on an ingredient, um, you know, called... Uh, Oh God, I can't even think of it now. Um, but it was uh, for memory. It's some crazy long, uh, like scientific name. Right. But they, uh, you know, so first of all, Harvard University. That's credibility. Everybody believes that anything that comes out of there is like gospel, right? Right. Yeah. Um, you know, there's like a huge, the credible institution organization, and. Um, the name of the ingredient is phosphatidylserine, PS, phosphatidylserine. And uh, they did a clinical study on it whereby, you know, they, they got a bunch of people with memory problems in for three months. They did this clinical study and they, at the end of it, they said, um, you know, it appears that like these people have rolled back 12 years of mental decline. Wow. The benefits to their brain has, you know, has... Uh, you know, they, they've, they've rolled back 12 years of mental decline. Their memory has improved. Their ability to think clearly has improved. So that's a very specific clinical right. study yeah. with, with an amazing result. Actually, all three aspects of what I said is wrapped up there. The USP is that, you know, take this pill and you'll reverse 12 years of mental decline. That's, that's your that's USP. A, that's a great USP, yeah. Yeah, exactly, you know. Uh, anyone who's afraid of, of losing their mind and ending up in a nursing home is going to be very, very interested in that. Um, so that's your USP. Your proof is that there was a clinical study done on this ingredient. Uh, you know, after, that was the result after three months. And the credibility is that it was done by Harvard University um, Medical School. And then there was all these other doctors talking about it. Like, you know, another doctor said that, like, you know, it might, you, you know, this ingredient might, uh, you know, uh, like put put an end to like nursing homes and stuff like that. I forget what the exact quote was, but there was all of this incredible proof, incredible <clears throat> credibility, incredible um, USP surrounding this ingredient. So that's a great example in the health space, you know. Yeah. Um, but it comes in different forms too. I was working on a uh, on a pain um, project a few years ago, and uh, there was a story of a woman whose husband was crippled. And, you know, she had, uh, you know, like they had always lived this active life and his knee had like deteriorated significantly and she had come up with um, uh, a way of regrowing the cartilage in his leg. She just finally had enough, you know, she didn't feel like they were ready to, <laughs> you know, succumb to old age in this right. manner, disability and everything. So she like went out and researched, spent like a year or so researching all of these different ways and means of of, uh, of healing her husband's knee and he was in a wheelchair at this stage and uh, she had eventually figured out a way in which to heal his knee and they you know spent I don't know what it was I can't remember now six seven months working on this thing working on his knee and eventually he was able to walk and they sold his wheelchair on eBay so I was like wow that's the, like you know um, the headline, the headline was uh, uh, "Woman regrows husband's uh, knee joint, sells wheelchair on eBay." <laughs> and I love how specific that is. Yeah, yeah, and that's a proof element. Why? How do you even find something like that, though? What? Where do you find research? Research. Yeah. research. You know, there's many different hats you have to wear as a copywriter, and one of them is like you're an investigative researcher. You know. Think of like CSI Miami. Look at how much detail they go through right. to uh, solve the case. You know, are there That's certain go-to sources, Caleb, that you recommend for like clinical research, looking up studies or or something like that, or for the health health space? Yeah, I mean, my go-to resource really is to purchase every product from every major mm. health company out there. And they give me all of the research in my mailbox <laughs> and in my email box every single day and week. Mm. So um, actually, here's a great example. Even I got this in the mail there the other day from Dr. Sinatra. And, uh, 
you know, Dr. Sinatra here has, uh, I don't know if you guys can see this, but he's got like maybe a hundred products here hmm. and outlines all of the various different uh, like clinical studies, all of the various different products with killer ingredients in them. Like look at this double blind clinically, con uh, what does it say? Double blind placebo controlled clinical study results. Wow. You know, so I mean, it's all here, you know, if you're, if you're, this is in the health space anyway, you know, right. so if you get on everyone's list and you find out, I mean, these guys have like teams of researchers scouring the medical journals of right. you know, every medical journal in the world looking for the latest, greatest, best stuff. And all mm. you got to do is buy their product once <laughs> a month, you get all that research. The ultimate research hack. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the ultimate research hack. Same online, you know, same online, you just spend like i usually spend a couple of hundred bucks a month just purchasing products that i don't need <laughs> just just to get on people's list you know oh my i love that um i want to talk about newspaper advertising and, and direct me on how you're bringing that back but first i want to talk about a couple milestones um with gary and then when you you went out on your own and the first ad you did i was reading it today um, so I, I somehow found it online. Um, the male potency ad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was the very first number 10 sales letter I wrote. Yeah. Yeah. So how did that go? How did that, um, cause he, he talks about it in the, the Gary Halbert news you know, letter and basically he's like, no one else could have written this sales letter better. Not uh -huh. Gary Benzavenga, not myself. And he basically goes on to say, Caleb wrote every word of this. If you think I did, I did not. He wrote this. And, and the headline goes, after seven years of intense research, scientists finally reveal the safest, most potently effective method for supercharging your sex drive, for completely curing impotency, and for having the most intense, mind-melting orgasms humanly possible. Yeah, <laughs> that's so uncompliant in today's uh, <laughs> regulatory really? environment. But it was uh, it was it was it was kosher back then. Why but, uh, why is that? What's changed? Oh, the laws the laws have changed. Yeah, I mean, you yeah. I mean, it's you, the word cure. You're you're in big trouble for mm. you today. Um, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, that was uh, <laughs> that was a, that was my first. That was the first. Uh, number 10 pack that was the first sales letter that I wrote all on my own um, I think he did he did change a PS or something in that I think he did change a couple of words in the PS but like 99.9% .9 of it was mm -hmm. mine and uh, it did really well it did really well for a while there yeah so that was my first uh, <laughs> my first uh, foray into direct mail was there a certain component of that particular product and sales letter that was easy or that was unusually difficult that you had to kind of do even more research or uh, with for that? Um, I don't even remember. That was like 11 years ago. I yeah. don't even remember. Uh, you know, I uh, it was so long ago that I, I just I really don't remember. But I know at the time... What was going on there is that we were working on so many projects and you know when you do something when you're working at that kind of pace um, you really hone your chops really well you know and I know that that letter came out really quick um, but mm. it was the culmination of there was a lot of projects that were going on there. So you know, it, it uh, if you're writing one sales letter every like three four months, um, it's very difficult to get into a rhythm there. So uh, the one thing that I do remember about that is that I was in a I was in a very good rhythm. <laughs> I was just writing. It was just one ad after another after mm. another. After another, after another, and then that one came along, and there was so much work going on that Gary didn't have anything to do with it. And for a finish, I was left alone to do it all. And when I handed it back, he was like, "Wow, this is nothing I want to change here." Although mm -hmm. I do remember a couple of words in the PS or something. I don't know. Mm -hmm. but, um, yeah, that was my yeah. first one I wrote all on my own. Yeah. Yeah, that's something maybe other I'm people should be so proud. What's that? <laughs> my mom would be so proud. <laughs> 
<laughs> you read her the headline, I'm sure she'd be proud of you. Yeah. Well, I mean, maybe she would be proud if she gave it to your dad, right? You know, gave the product. <laughs> no, I'm just... <laughs> um, but yeah, okay, I mean, let's maybe. Move on there, Jeremy. What's that? <laughs> let's move on from now. <laughs> we stepped over the bounds. That's okay. Um, so, what? How did you know it was you were ready to move out on your own and not continue under Gary? Uh I didn't. He died. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. I mean, oh. I was writing. Um, I had no idea. Yeah, he uh, he. Uh, I had moved to to Costa Rica, um, and I continued to work with him for a while. But he had, from the very get go, he told me, "Don't become a great copywriter." He's mm. like, "Just don't do it." He's like, "Become good enough, and go and start your own business." Mm. So, uh, his thing was, you know, become really good. And do it all for yourself. Yeah. And he, uh, so that was kind of my mission. I was working with him to get the training, and uh, I he was also helping John, my brother, and I get into direct mail. So while I was working with him, I was also working on my own business with him, mm -hmm. oh, I, under his, you know, um, supervision. Supervision, yeah. exactly. So. Um, yeah, and that was another great thing about him as well, you know, like he, uh, you know, he, he kind of wasn't selfish in that way. He was setting me up to yeah. be like my own person, you know. It's a true and, mentor. Uh, he, he, was, yeah. he just wanted you to do your own thing. Yeah, yeah, that was it. He taught me direct mail and he taught me newspaper advertising and taught me all about marketing and, and, and quickly pushed me into my own thing. Um, he wanted me to become kind of independent and to be doing my own thing, so... I guess it wasn't like a shocking transition. I mean, he passed away, yeah. and I, I think at that stage I had kind of moved away into doing yeah. my own thing with him, uh, away from him anyway. But uh, I don't know if there was a particular time where yeah. I realized that, like, you know, it's Tuesday and now I must go out on my own. Um, it just kind of, right. kind of rolled into that over time. Yeah, yeah. I mean that sounds. He set me up that way. That sounds like a devastating. I had no idea that's when, like, the timing of when you moved on. That sounds devastating, you know, personally and emotionally when that happens. Yeah, well, I, you know, I, you know, I don't. As I said, I, I think by that stage I had already rolled on to mm -hmm. um, kind of doing my own stuff. So I don't think it was. It it wasn't such a such a, a cut off like that, mm -hmm. you know. I think that I had moved on into my own stuff at that stage. Yeah. So what was then the big breakthrough with your, when you move on, you're doing your own campaigns, your own company. What was the first big breakthrough? Um, in terms of like... Like uh, a campaign that you ran that was successful? Um... I don't know, uh, actually. I mean, one kind of led into the next, led into the next, led into the next. Um, I mean, there was many campaigns that mm. were successful. I don't know like if there was like one that kind of put us on the map. Mm. Um, there were there were several that nearly took us off the map, though. <laughs> what do you mean? There were, <clears throat> no, just like, you know, just, just campaigns that, uh, you know, there is... Um, you know, always examples of, of, of big winners and always yeah. examples of, of big losers, you know. Right. So there are, uh, that's the name of the game. Part of, actually, that was a, a big thing that Gary told me as well, taught me at the start, which was, you know, he said the one of the like biggest reasons why I'm considered so great <laughs> among my peers is because I fail more than anyone else I know. Hmm. And that was an important lesson for me because I realized that like failure is a part of the equation. What he was right. saying to me was, and what he taught me was that, like failure is a part of the equation. In fact, Sam and I were even talking uh, recently about failure. Even the very best of the best, their batting average is is never a hundred percent. Even right. like you know fifty percent is a huge success rate. Right. Uh, you know so. Uh, yeah, failure is a part of the game. Yeah. And, um, 
So what yeah. were you guys talking about failure? Uh, batting averages in mm. terms of like success for starting new businesses, mm-hmm. success in writing new ads. Um, you know, I've worked with a lot of great, great copywriters over the years and they've all had big failure rates. Yeah. You know? But I mean, statistically, you're, you're playing a game of statistical averages. You know? Right. Um, you know, if, if, uh, if you have a 10% success rate and you continue to play the game, you know, one big winner will make up for nine losses. You know, right. you can get rich. You can get rich on uh, on one big winner. You know, so you right. don't need. You know, you just need perseverance. You need to. Uh, you need to play the game. Failure is a big part of it, for sure. Yeah. So, Caleb, what was a big loser and a big winner? A big loser, and why? Looking back, why it didn't work. Um. You know, it's not that the, like, you know, controls always run out of steam, Mm -hmm. you know. A winning ad, there's always a time, like a timer on that, an egg timer on that. Mm. Um, I would say that, you know, most of the failures came through a lack of experience more Mm. so than anything else. Um, You know, getting caught out by a, uh, a failing ad you know, not understanding um, the imp- like, you know, when the cycle can end. Uh, there's so many. <laughs> so here's a, like here's a great example. I mean, in the newspapers, I mean, you know, without knowing the lay of the land, without knowing how the, that whole industry operates, you can you can lose your shirt. You know, like for example, in December, December is a month that if you're running a huge schedule, you're going to lose your shirt. Why? Because all of the advertising space is purchased by uh, large, you know, companies. They're they're purchased like it's all that kind of for Christmas. Christmas. Stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So you know the newspapers essentially sell out all of their advertising, and you know direct marketers don't get you know regular placements. So um, what can happen is you know you have two or three hundred thousand dollars worth of ads waiting to drop, and they don't drop you know like in a sequential manner they don't drop evenly per day um you know so you could have two or three hundred thousand dollars worth of ads drop on tuesday which like can blow up your your like blow up everything blow up your call center <laughs> blow up your merchant account blow up you know just every last thing in your business and uh you know if you're not aware of you know such issues and and you you stumble into them, which we have stumbled into <laughs> on many occasions. You know you can you can uh, you can you know you can get burned by them. So um, there's lots of examples like that in marketing. It's the mm-hmm. same online. It's the same in direct mail. It's the same in every channel. Every channel, every means of advertising has its peculiarities. Has its you know its. Uh, it's tips and tricks for, for succeeding and, 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 you know, uh, potholes that you have to be careful of. Mm-hmm. So there's lots of examples like that where, uh, you know, just not being experienced enough in the past, you kind of wander into a landmine and, and you step on it without knowing that it's even there, you know? Yeah. So why are so many people not doing direct mail and more specifically newspaper advertising? Yeah, they just don't know about it, you know. I mean, everybody is online these days. I mean, newspapers was the internet before the internet came along, you right. know. Um, newspapers was the was the flow of information. Everyone was on there reading those newspapers and, you know, that was the internet. So the internet came along and everybody just abandoned these mm. two mediums, moved right. on to the internet and now like the generation that's growing up on the internet you know doesn't know what it was like you know previous to the internet so um just people have just forgotten about them and uh it's a it's a wonderful thing because they're just a gargantuan way of of making a ton of money i mean in the health space alone, you can have a hundred million dollar business in direct mail and another hundred million dollar business in the newspapers. So, I mean, you know, that's the size of the opportunity for some guys that know how to operate on that level. And it's a it's it's a wonderful little opportunity for 
you know, smaller guys who, who just have a few thousand dollars to, well, direct mail, not, but newspapers would be a, a great opportunity for, you know, for people of all levels. Um, so I, it's just people have forgotten about them. It's a lost art. Mm-hmm. Very few know how to do them, you know. So what are some of the key things people must know? about newspaper advertising? I mean, you mentioned a huge pitfall of you advertising in December. What are some other things people need to know? I think, you know, there's a lot of things people know. First of all, the opportunity is huge. I mean, that's first and foremost. I mean, you know, it's a forgotten medium, but as a means of generating new leads and customers, it's massive. I mean, there's 56 million newspapers sold every single day in America. It's like, I don't know what it is, but it's over a billion newspapers sold a month. Um, so, you know, uh, they advertise in every city and town all over the country every single day. Um, the opportunity is just massive. The, the second, I think, thing that people need to understand, at least as it relates to kind of operating in the newspapers, is that the style of sales copy is very, very different. Mm. It's a radically different style of sales copy. In fact, you know, the biggest reason for failure in the newspapers is that, like, guys try and take their online sales copy that works so well for them online mm-hmm. and, uh, and apply it to the newspapers. It just doesn't work. It's, it's, you know, the lay of the land is different. You know, the, 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 uh, you know, the expectations of a newspaper reader are different. Yeah. So that whole style of writing is radically different. There's nothing like it. There isn't. You can't compare it to any other. It's it's not the same as direct mail. It's not the same as online. It's not the same as infomercials, radio ads. Nothing. It's 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 entirely different. So, you you know that would be another big secret. Find out how to <laughs> write for the newspaper ads. All right, write newspaper ads. And the third thing I would say is that you know the the ability to control your growth and control your volume in the newspapers is like nothing else out there. Hmm. Uh, what do you mean? Well, uh, you you just have control. I mean, if you have a winning ad, you know, all you have to do is, is just run that ad in more newspapers. It's really as simple as that. I mean, we ran an ad um, a few years ago and it's, it's, it's a, uh, it's an example of how it can be done. You know, I I, uh, I wouldn't advise people move this quickly, but this is exactly what we did. Excuse me. We had a um, a full page newspaper ad in the, the heart market, and we started out and we tested it. Uh, I think we spent two thousand dollars testing it, and within three months we had scaled to about three hundred and twenty thousand dollars a month in ad spend. Wow, which is huge. It's, yeah. it's huge. We were within three months. We had like fully scaled to that um, wow. point, and it's not like media buying, you know, online, where you know it's almost a science. You need fifty-seven different ads. You need text ads. You need banner ads. You need pre-sale pages. You need this, that, and the other. In the newspapers, you just have one ad, so. It's just about running that ad right. in more newspapers. It's about just just growing the the right. exposure that you have. So there's very few ways in all of direct response that you can do that. Um, in fact, you know, media buying online would probably be the closest thing to it. Mm-hmm. But even that is so complicated. It's it's a science. It's a massive operation to achieve the same thing that you can achieve in the newspapers. You need 10 times more people, you know, 10 times more sales copy, at least, you know, 10 times more sales copy. The complications and and potential landmines are much, much greater, you know, online. So mm-hmm. I think control and the ability to control over your volume and the ability to scale in the newspapers really differentiates from a lot of other yeah. uh, means of, of customer acquisition and lead generating, you know. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned a few things. Um, sales copy is one. What kind of style should someone be thinking about? Because you said it's a lot different from online and even direct mail. Yeah, Gary, Gary really cracked the code on on that whole uh, approach to writing sales ad, uh, newspaper ads. Um, 
the primary concept is that your newspaper ad should look like a article in the newspapers. It should look like the reporter has done a story mm. on your product and is presenting it as an exciting new solution that's mm. sweeping the nation. Right. Um, you know, a lot of people make the mistake of writing an ad that looks like an ad. Um, and people don't read the newspapers for advertisements. People read the newspaper for the news. Right. So if your ad is camouflaged as a news story, right. the quantity of readership that you will attract will, will be many, many multiples greater yeah. than readership that a, that a straight up sales, uh, you know, a straight up advertisement would capture. Yeah. And in newspapers, it's, you know, attention, you know, attention plus readership is money, you know, the more attention you can, you can, you can attract and the more of that attention you can turn into readership and the more people you can get to read your ad and the more they're going to buy, the more they're going to get, the more, the more they are going to purchase. So, yeah. um, that's really, you know, the masters of newspaper ads and they're all dead now with the exception of, uh, one guy. Uh, you know, really have spent a lot of time learning from reporters mm. how to present their advertisement as a news story within the newspapers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's huge. You know, and you mentioned a few things too about, um, you know, when you said if someone, all their ads fall on uh, Tuesday and it blows up their call sign or blows up all these things. You know, obviously there's an ad, but then there's a you have um, a specific infrastructure in place to actually complete the sales. What kind of things should be you know people be thinking on that front? Yeah, uh, you know, there's there's several different systems that you can employ in the newspapers. I mean, you know, one of the best, uh, one of our preferred methods is to drive um, people to a telephone number. You know, call this phone number to order. Why? Because that's how that prospect is used to doing business yeah, in yeah. The newspapers. Um, so that kind of has the highest conversion in terms of selling directly off the page. There's also a way of lead generating, you know, um, like acquiring leads. Um, and there's also a way of driving lots and lots of traffic from the newspapers online. Um, you know, we've got a, a campaign right now that we're working on. And uh, it's, it sells a free report. And when you get on the phone to get the free report, we'll say, hey, you know, we'll send this free report to you, um, you know, uh, by mail. Because, again, that ties into, like, how that customer in the newspaper is used to doing business. And then we'll mm -hmm. say, um, but, you know, later on, you know, we can also send you um, the report, you know, it'll arrive in your home in the next three to five business days, but we can also um, send it to you by email and you'll have it in the next few minutes. So then we capture the email mm. and then we hit them up for a webinar that's happening the next day. You know, by the way, we're holding this free uh, video training on the internet and we can sign you up right now. And in that way, we're able to take the newspapers, which is a very offline medium, offline channel, and we're able to uh, make it very, very successful and, and, and very profitable and very lucrative for online guys. Yeah. So there's a lot of different systems that you can employ, a lot of different things that you can do, a different strategies that you can, you can uh, employ to achieve what you want to achieve in your business. And at the end of the day, we're all looking for two things, more leads and more customers. And this is really, you know, a huge, and the beauty of it, the real beauty of it, is no one doing it. Right competition and it's an entire channel <laughs> channel you know so um yeah it really is a huge opportunity and there's many different ways you can leverage it so caleb do you are there certain markets people should definitely use newspaper or shouldn't use it like if they go caleb i have this i'm in this market or service industry you're like no you should not go and do newspaper are there any markets that you should yeah. and shouldn't yeah, absolutely. Um, it's it's not you know it's uh, we compared I compared it to Google a, little, uh, a few minutes ago, but it's not Google. You know, you you can't sell 
how to teach your parrot to talk in the newspapers, you know, like you can do with Google AdWords. You can select, you know, you know, keywords that people are bidding on there for such a tight uh, niche. Can't do that in the newspapers. Newspapers is mass media marketing. Mm, mm. Um, the other thing too is that 75% of newspaper readers are over the age of 45, which means that if you're selling uh, a product or service to a younger uh, prospect, a prospect under 45, the newspapers is just not for you. It's just not the way to go there. Yeah. Um, however, if you are selling something to a, a prospect over age 45, the only other requirement that you really need to have is that like you're offering a, a, a solution to a mass problem. You know, uh, prime examples of that would be health, you know, the heart market, arthritis, um, you know, uh, financial, you know, anything not to do with financial, um, any, any, just essentially there's, there's a really, really wide variety of, uh, you know, I know one guy who's selling a, a, a heater, um, he's selling a heater and he sells like a hundred million dollars worth of these heaters. Wow. In the news wow. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Just, you know, so like any, any mass market product to folks over 45 is going to work really, really well in the newspapers. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so you just talked about the heater example. What's another, so people can see the the possibility of newspaper ads. What's another example of a result from newspaper advertising? Yeah, I mean, information, health supplements, gadgets, you know, gadgets of like heaters. You know, I'm just trying to like, there's heaters, coolers. <laughs> there is, uh, you know, um, what else is there? There is... Uh, all things money related. There's even an air purifier. I saw a guy just selling a lot of like air purifiers. Uh, real estate guys do really, really well. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's it, you know, there's just too many options there. Yeah. There's too many uh, ideas there. But I mean, the the core kind of criteria for success, as I said, is that you're selling to a you know a, a prospect 45 years of age and older, and you are solving a mass problem. Yeah, you're offering a solution to a mass problem. So anything finance related, anything self help related, right. um, you know. Oh, there's a, another one is uh, there's a guy that sells like a, a, a kind of a, a box. This is an example of a great gadget, and they're doing massive volume. They're sen selling um, a box like that gives you like something like a thousand channels mm. for TV. Um, and that's really, really selling very, very well. Um, so, I mean, there's there's an endless, endless examples of stuff that are selling well. What sort of some obstacles people tell you why they don't do newspaper? Like I could see one. Well, Caleb, I don't have three hundred three hundred thousand dollars a month to spend on advertising. What what do you tell people? Yeah, I mean, look, if you're spending three hundred thousand dollars on advertising, you're purchasing like like 300 newspapers or more right. you know so i mean you don't like you you know you can purchase a newspaper ad for 150 dollars hmm. you know um you know you can i mean we test now for two thousand dollars when i was doing this with gary he never spent more than a thousand bucks never spent more than a thousand bucks on a newspaper ad and we were writing them all the time you know we were always testing ads always writing new ads testing them he put a thousand dollars down we test them see if they worked um, but he never spent more than a thousand dollars. So, you know, people might think that it's really expensive. It's mm -hmm. not. You know, it's not at all. I mean, you can. It's it's. Uh, <clears throat> you know, it's hard to say that it's more, like it's it's cheaper than online. But for us, it's cheaper. Than, well, because you know what you're doing. <laughs> so, you know what we're yeah. doing. Yeah. But I mean, I think that like the cost of advertising online has exploded. I mean, we were doing massive volume several years ago online and just got out of it. Yeah. Why? Because the costs just kept going up and up and up and up and up and the cost to acquire a customer just became ridiculous. So we abandoned ship and uh, we're just not seeing those costs for our business in the newspapers these days. Yeah. The, and the reason for it is very simple. You know, online, um, your competition is fierce. Every single day, there's more competitors coming into your market right. every single day. And they're driving the cost per click up. 
you know, you're bidding a dollar, some guy comes along, he builds, you know, uh, bids a dollar, one cent. Now you're not getting the same amount of traffic. So now you got to bid, bid, you know, a dollar and two cent. Then another guy comes in and it's a dollar and three cent. Right. And it's just, it never stops. You, ne you never control. You're never, you know, the, the cheapest traffic you're ever going to have is the traffic you're paying for right now today. Right. And in, in 10 minutes, you might not be paying the same. Right. You know, this is probably coming on. So the the cost of 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 uh, of traffic is always increasing mm -hmm. because the quantity of competition is is always increasing. Yeah, newspapers is you know there's no competition. Um, you know, so in many regards, the the cost to advertise is has come down. Um, you know, and there's another factor that goes into that equation as well. The there used to be a tremendous amount of waste circulation in the newspapers because you know everyone was in the newspapers. But nowadays, you know, it is a shrinking. You know, the the amount of people reading the newspapers is shrinking. However, that's a really great thing because the segment of people that are disappearing from the newspapers are the under forty fives. They're going on the internet. And as a reason, but the, the over 45s are very loyal to their newspapers. They're going to be reading newspapers until, you know, they pass away. So right. there is this, you know, this this right. core group of right. 45 plus yeah. people that are reading their newspapers. And as a result, the waste circulation is becoming less and less and less. So the newspapers is becoming more and more and more mm -hmm. targeted. There's no competition. So the medium itself is becoming more targeted right. and the cost to advertise is, is rock bottom. You know, yeah. you could purchase an ad today for at a 95% discount. Wow. So we, you know, would spend $300,000 and, you know, we're purchasing, you know, I don't know, do the calculation, $2 million worth of advertising per month. Right. And you just can't do that online. You know, you just can't do that online at all. So for us, yeah, we know what we're doing. But it's there for everyone also. It's there for, mm. for everyone to learn. It's there for everyone to do. So, um, you know, for us, it's just a cheaper way of acquiring customers. And offline customers are far, they're a far greater quality customer. You know, they're more loyal. Why? Again, because if you acquire a customer online, that customer is the customer of 27 other companies, you know, um, especially the way marketing is done online as well. It's all cross promoting. <laughs> Everyone is advertising on the same network for the same traffic. Offline, there's just there's no other companies, you know, competing for your customers. So when yeah. you hire a customer, that customer is yours. They're more loyal. They're willing to spend more money. The refund rates are generally lower. Um, the average tickets are higher, and you know the the willingness to spend more money with your business on the back end is much greater. So. So Caleb, um, you know, let's say okay, Caleb, you've convinced me. I want to do newspaper ads <laughs> right now. What, yeah. Where should people start? Um, they should. They yeah, look. Here's the thing. You know, again, online things are very different. There's 57 different things you got to think about to get going. Right. In the newspapers, it's very. It's you know the the criteria for success is much lower. All you need at at this beginning phase is a killer ad. Mm -hmm. So it boils down to the ad. A lot of success online is not necessarily your sales letter. A lot of people would would not be willing to uh, like say that, but actually it's true. There's a lot of you can have a killer sales letter online, and your business is you know going nowhere. Right. Um, if you have a killer sales letter in the newspapers, you're making a ton of money. It's as simple as that. Yeah. So it's about it's about figuring out how to write a really killer newspaper ad. Right. That's, there's three phases to it. Yeah, you know, getting a killer ad, getting your ad tested, and then uh, rolling out. So I mean, if, if to get started, it's all about the ad. So they should just take your uh, male potency and rewrite it a hundred times. No, so they can... <laughs> the newspaper. That's a direct mail. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Find winning newspaper ads for sure. Research, research. You know the gods of the newspapers, Gary Halbert, Gene Schwartz, yeah. and if you can find anything from a guy called Ben Suarez, it will be a, it'll be a very lucky yeah. person. And I know that you online, I mean, I think I looked you up uh, 
all over the place. You, you're like I said, the mafia. Like you only hear about you, but you there's nothing there. Is there something that people can check out from your expertise online? Like, is there some kind of training or something like that that they can look at um, to guide them? Um, you know, well, uh, so we have this website, multi-channel marketing, where you know there there is some you know educational stuff there. There's mm-hmm. a report. We've got all about newspaper advertising. There's some videos there as well that people can watch. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, <laughs> we 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 don't uh, we're not all over the internet for yeah. sure. Uh, so, but people can go to that website, multichannelmarketing.com, and and check it out. So, yeah, yeah, because it's it sounds like a I mean underutilized amazing opportunity. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of channels, you know. I mean, the, you know, there's a lot of uh, underutilized um, opportunities, yeah. particularly offline. Yeah, I yeah. love when you talk about this because, you know, you always hear like the most successful people, when, when people are going one way, the most successful people go the opposite way uh, from the masses. And that's what this seems like to me. Yeah, well, again, you know, the internet is a blip on the map. I mean, it just came along like yesterday you know so before mm-hmm. the internet came along there's like decades worth of, of of marketing has taken place in things like direct mail and the newspapers yeah. you know radio and tv um all of these mediums existed long 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 before the internet ever came along yeah um, and again as i said you know just the the people that are growing up today they're growing up on the internet um not realizing that like all of these all of the education they're receiving today, um, in terms of marketing, copywriting, all of that, all of that education has come from, you know, decades worth of of of, uh, you know, experience, testing, learning, optimizing, discovering yeah. offline. Yeah. So, yeah. So, Kill, you know, since it's Inspired Insider, I always ask the question: What's been your lowest moment, and how you push forward? Yeah, what's been my lowest moment and how I pushed forward? You know, I I can't think of a particular lowest moment, but I do know, <laughs> you know, life is is uh, is you know you can have. I've I've certainly had periods of time where nothing, you know, works. Uh, you know, not just in marketing, not just in copywriting, but in life. You know, yeah. relationships you know, friends, family, health. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I kind of believe that life is kind of like a peak and, and trough, you know, mm. there's ups and downs. Um, and I I guess uh, I'm aware of those phases, you know, sometimes you're up, sometimes you're down. Um, I'm not sure if I've, uh, <laughs> I guess I'm aware of them. Maybe I'm a little better at dealing with them than I used to be. But my brother, John, really has uh he's really wise behind you know beyond these years and he's he's always been my my older brother and my mentor and he's mm-hmm. uh, he has a lot of great philosophies mm-hmm. and uh one of them that i think serves me very very well um you know when problems arise or when hard times hit or when you know on those times when i'm uh, <laughs> i'm in the trough of life yeah he has this this uh, this concept of um, deal with the issue, not the emotion, and hmm. it served me very well. The emotion of 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 failures, the emotion, you know, whether they're business, copywriting, life, whatever, the emotion of failures, you know, can not serve you at yeah, all. Be paralyzing, and, yeah. Yeah, they can be absolutely paralyzing. Um, but by focusing on the issue that needs to be fixed, resolved, overcome, surpassed, you kind of step out of the uh, poor me paralyzed position mm-hmm. and into a place of action where you can actually do something about it. And I have seen guys, um, you know, just devastated by failures, mm. um, you know, real powerful strong guys <laughs> you know wiped out by failures emotionally um and i would say that you know 
if you're going to be in this business and you're going to be successful, you're going to have big failures. Mm -hmm. Everyone has. I know nobody, genuinely, I know no big successful guy, guru, or, you know, just, just a successful business guy that has not been exposed to tremendous, you know, failures right. and a lot of failure. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah. how you deal with that, how you deal with that and how you overcome that, I think, yeah. is, is, is a lesson worth learning. And definitely for me in my life, yeah. my brother's wise advice of, of dealing, you know, deal with the issue, not the emotion, yeah. not just take action yeah. to get started in the right direction or correct something or fix it, takes me out of this poor me or it wasn't that terrible or how horrible it was place and puts me into a place of taking action. Yeah. So. And that's, you know, Caleb, what I love about these type of conversations with successful entrepreneurs because every single person says that and they have the struggles or the mistakes or the failures and you forget that because you see them as a successful person yeah. and you don't see all the trials and tribulations along the way and it just is a great reminder of to not beat ourselves up so much just to kind of bounce back because all these people you know had that you know yeah yeah and i really do believe you know like uh, you know gary used to say just you know <laughs> i forget actually how he used to say it but it was funny 90 percent of success boils down to a pig <laughs> piggish determination to never give up or something like that. I can't remember. Right. But anyway, like right. just never give up. You know, right. it's the guy who uh, the guy who never gives up is usually the guy that's going to win at the end of the day. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So. So Caleb, what was one of those times that John had to remind you to focus on the issue, not the emotion? <laughs> um. Regularly, I think you know. <laughs> regularly. Yeah. When you was know, the last time? I'm trying to. Remember. I'm trying to put it like so I can picture what what the context is and like what the issue and the emotion was and how he because I think that's a powerful statement so I can wrap my my mind around it with the specific example. Yeah, I would say past past failures. You know, I mean, when you kind of work at a level where there's a lot of money on the line, mm -hmm. there's a lot of people looking over your shoulder. Um, you know, it's, it's a very intimidating scenario, you know, like if you're going to be a copywriter and if you're going to be doing deals with people, um, and you're going to be doing it at a high level, you've got to realize that you're, you're on the chopping board there. I mean, you know, the, the, the really tough thing for copywriters to understand is that, excuse me, um, you are always going to be measured. You know, very, very few people in this world are measured. That's the great you know? thing about copywriting direct response and then, and then maybe the yeah. not so good thing because you're held accountable, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it's you, you. It's very easy to tie your self-worth up into that mm. decimal point, those conversions, you know, mm. um, <clears throat> because it's real, you know, it's, it's real. Copywriters are measured business, you know, direct response marketers are measured. I mean, it, it, you're measured by a decimal point. I mean, it, it, you know, that's how tightly measured you are. Um, so it's, it's very difficult to deal with, you know, with, uh, with, with that kind of <laughs> attention. There's a lot of money on the line. There's a lot of people looking at you. There's a lot of people peering over your shoulder. There's a lot of, of big plans. Um, and just sometimes they don't go right and sometimes they go really well, you know, sometimes mm. they go fantastic. Um, you know, the, you just have to learn to take the, the good with the bad. Um, and it, this was our conversation with Sam as well. I mean, like even the best of the best, um, everyone has successes and I, again, you know, it's, and, and everyone has failures. Uh, so it's, it's how you deal with those failures and, yeah. you know, those ways is is uh, <laughs> you know deal with the issue, not the emotion. Um, you know if something isn't working, you know don't go and beat yourself up about it. Just go and fix it, get it done. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So that would have been an example. Uh, that kind of example is is uh, at least in the you know at least in the past was a very relevant. <laughs> so how you bounce back is you. In, instead of beating yourself up or, or you identify you're beating yourself up, you will 
fix whatever the issue is at hand and you'll just focus on that. Yeah, 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 exactly. Just just fix whatever needs to be fixed, you know. Um, Gary had this thing of, of if you're going to fail, fail quick and, and, and fail cheap, you know. So, <laughs> right. uh, and it is a great philosophy of, of, of marketing, you know. Um, but, yeah, you know, so, I mean, these days I've really, you know, <laughs> I really try and fail cheap and fail fast, you know. Um, yeah, I guess I'm trying. I'm, I'm struggling to kind of come up with these examples for you, Jeremy. I don't. Uh, I, these things are not so specific for me. You uh, talk to your like you say, okay, here's. I'm really kind of feeling beat up here, and you'll call your brother, or what? How does that look? Uh, or is it just you're <laughs> talking to him regularly? Uh, well, yeah, he's my business partner, yeah. so. I him every yeah. day. I'm just curious. Like, is there like there was a specific campaign? Like this one just went. I did not think it was gonna go like that. And you'll call him on the phone and and just be like, I don't want to do anything for a week because I hate myself from that. <laughs> no, no. It's oh, okay. Like, no, 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 no. I'm no. just wondering how that conversation goes. Um. Yeah, it's definitely not like that. Okay. I, I, yeah, it's not. It's not go hide in a hole for a week. <laughs> it's not like that at all. It's, you know, it's it's more about. Um, okay, I mean, as it as it relates to copywriting, I mean, it's it's you know, in the past, like I fail regularly. I failed recently, but I mean, now my failures are more calculated. You know, mm. like for example, I had an ad like in the in a heart space. So um, there's an appeal that I wanted to test out, but I knew it was a small appeal. I, like it's, you know, I knew that, like statistically speaking, not that many heart patients are going to have that problem. However, I was curious to find out if there was a small percentage would more of them buy because they're probably not like being served in that manner. Um, so um, it's just one of those things that I wanted to test out. So. Mm -hmm. You know, I tested it out. It didn't work. You know, um, <laughs> and yeah, it's like, gosh, you know, I really wrote a great ad there, and that particular thing didn't work out. So, you know, I, yeah, when you put a lot of effort into something, and you put a, there's like this disappointment. Right. Um, you know, but I, I again, I guess, like as I said, over time, I've kind of learned to internalize mm. things in a much different manner. Yeah. Um, I, you know, haven't had like. Um, like maybe I haven't been emotionally devastated. Yeah. Maybe like <laughs> I mean, you know, one thing that sticks out, and we were talking previously is, I mean, I'm not saying this is a low moment, but it's something I visualize as a starting point, which is I forgot what you were talking about, but you were talking about laying, you know, sleeping on a floor, and yeah. Oh, yeah, you know yeah. what I'm talking about? To okay. Take, yeah. you know, yeah, paint okay. the picture for me there. What was going on? <laughs> yeah, you're good. You're good if you remember that. Okay, see, I, I probably have all of these experiences. I just can't think of them. But yeah, yeah you I block them I, out. You don't I want to think about them. it. I'm just too busy dealing with the issue, not you. Um, I uh, yeah, when I worked with with Gary, um, so I, I I was you know I went there for three weeks and it was my big shot. I had three weeks. That was it. Get in, get out. Um, and at the end of three weeks, he was like, look, you know, I see a lot of potential in you and I think you should stay here. I think you should come and, and, uh, and, and work with me. Yeah. But I'm not going to do you any favors, you know. He's like, if you want to learn this thing, you got to learn it yourself and you got you to gotta sink or swim. No, sorry, not learn this thing yourself. You got to, you gotta, if you want to succeed, you gotta, it's going to be sink or swim. And again, another great, great lesson. Like, you know, it, it sounds harsh, but a great, great lesson. Because um, without having so much on the line, you know, like Gary had this gun to the head um, philosophy on marketing. It's like succeed or die. And when you're in a succeed or die situation, your approach to everything you do um, has this tremendous intensity around it. Um, you know, and that's the the intensity that you need to succeed. So, um, you know, his thing was, uh, you know, you're going to rent an apartment overhead my apartment. You're not going to have any furniture. You're not going to have any chairs. You're not going to have any anything. 
And if you want a bed or you want a chair or you want a pillow or anything, you better get darn good at this game and you better start earning this money yourself. Right. And so for like, I don't know how many months, I slept <laughs> on the floor of the apartment using my jumper, my sweater as a pillow. Um, there was no furniture, no bed, no nothing. Mm. And eventually, <laughs> through like minor successes with him, um, like, hey, you know, this thing that we did that worked, here's a little bit of money. Um, you know, I went out and bought like a, a picnic table and chairs uh, <laughs> and put it in the apartment. And I was like, wow, this is great. You know, I got, <laughs> got a little picnic chair and table here. <laughs> Um, and then, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and then it grew into like a pump-up mattress, and <laughs> right. and eventually, little by little by little, as I started to right. to uh, to succeed more and more, I was able to uh, put more and more furniture into the apartment. So, right. but yeah, like during that particular point in time, and he would put me in those situations as well, which was like, I mean, when I started doing direct mail, yeah. he, he never gave me any money, you know, he never like he, I had to earn it, so started out with like a thousand letters so uh, you know he would he, i would go to kinko's with him we would get the we would print out the the sales letter then we go buy envelopes and then we go buy a pen and then we go buy stamps and right. i would come back with all of like the necessary ingredients to put a mailing out there right. and i would lick the envelopes fold the, the sales letters right. put them in there and we would dry like it would take so long um to do that and it's painful excruciating and just right. boring you know right. and uh, and but like my money was on the line John's money was on the line right. and we would go and put that mailing in the mail and that like that fear of like gosh is it going to work like am I going to get my money back here is it going to work right. uh, that pressure of having your own money on the line and, and your own you know, like it's it's everything. He just made me own everything. You know, it's yeah. like if you're going to succeed, it's going to be all your fault, and if you're going if you're going to fail, it's going to be all your fault as well. Right. Like you, it's total ownership of everything. Yeah. Um, and uh, so yeah, yeah, I lived I lived in a in a on a on a on the floor. Um, right. Alone, no nothing for like a few months there, and little by little, things <laughs> started to grow and. And uh, and earn <laughs> things got better, thank God. Yeah. So um, during that time, you know what was you know the the thing that kind of kept me going. I, I don't really know. It was the pressure of failure, the pressure of like having so much on the line, the pressure of the dissatisfaction of sleeping on the floor with no pillow. <laughs> right. That's a motivator. <laughs> That's a big motivator. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, I, and I think like, you know, Gary used to say, uh, you know, I'm never as good as when I'm about an inch away from going under. Right. That's when I'm the best. You'll you know? claw. Yeah. Yeah. You kick and scream and fight and claw your way back up that the totem pole of success. And, and I, I understand that, you know, I understand that. And yeah. it, it is a wonderful thing, you know, to be put under that kind of pressure because you never yeah. know what you're capable of doing until yeah. you're really tested, you know. Yeah, Caleb, thank you for for sharing that. That's power. <laughs> that's powerful stuff, yeah. really. Thank you for reminding me. Yeah. So, on the flip side of things, what's been one of the proudest moments? Um, proudest moments, I think, would be. Um, Proudest moments, I think, would be probably being able to help um, family, hmm. like to be doing so well hmm. where you're able to send your parents, um, you know, on vacation hmm. to <laughs> some crazy country yeah. for a month or two or, yeah. you know, to be able to share in the good um, yeah. The good fruits of your hard work with the people you love, mm. I think, has probably been, and will continue to be, yeah. um, one of the the best things I think for me in this business for sure. Where would you send them? My brother John and I sent them to uh, Brazil mm. for 
think it was three months they traveled. Wow, around. that's amazing. Yeah, they didn't like, yeah. How'd you break that to them? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. It was just, uh, I mean, just, it's not like, just, oh, hey, by the way, I'm sending you. you I mean, what was yeah, that conversation you, like? Where do you want to go? What would be crazy? What would be like a real crazy adventure for you guys? Mm. And just Brazil, I don't know. And they <laughs> they did it. They spent. Uh, they went down and, and traveled all around. They did had an, a, a, just a, a true adventure. You know, I mean, they're in their sixties, so it was just a, an amazing adventure for them to go mm. on and uh, have this crazy South American Brazilian. And they traveled. Actually, it wasn't just Brazil. They went to um, mm. they went to Argentina. They went to yeah. It was like several countries that they traveled mm. to. Uh, had just an amazing experience. So. Anytime there's a few uh, there's a few bottles of wine opened up back home, all those stories come out again, and it's it's, it's really nice. That's amazing. Know? Yeah. So, so, Caleb, I have one last question, but before I ask, where should we point people towards? Where should they check you out? Because there's only one follower on LinkedIn, and I can't find you on Facebook or anywhere else. So, where should uh, people? I'm on LinkedIn. I didn't even. <laughs> yeah, you have one one connection there. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I, don't know. I have. I don't think I've ever even been on LinkedIn. But anyway, I am. Um, yeah, multichannelmarketing.com is is a great place to go. Okay. Uh, you know, if if any of your listeners are are interested in in learning about newspaper advertising yeah. or getting started doing it or anything, um, you know, I'd be happy to to give these people uh you know like a a, a free strategy session if that's what mm. they were interested. Wow, in. that'd be valuable. Um, that'd be very generous. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, it, to get the, you know, to go to the website is multichannelmarketing.com. To uh, you know, anyone who's interested in signing up for a uh, a free strategy session can go to uh, multichannelmarketing.com forward slash newspaper call hmm. forward slash newspaper call and uh, and I'd be delighted to talk with them well, about newspaper advertising if that's what they were interested in. Yeah, and only if you're very serious because. You're a busy man in limited time. <laughs> Please don't waste my time. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we talked about a lot here, and I, this has been amazing. So thank you so much. Yeah, um, thank you. What should we leave people with? What should we leave? Yeah. People? What's what's um something now that they should think about? Since we did talk about a lot of different things with newspaper ads, copywriting, psychology. What do you? What final words uh, should yeah. stick out with with everything? Maybe get you know mentor the idea mm. of a mentor. Yeah, um, I really cannot convey how mentors have altered yeah. my direction in life. Yeah, you know I have. Uh, been very very lucky to have had mentors really wonderful mentors in my life um you know my brother john gary several other um guys trainers mentors advisors um i really think that you know nothing could be more valuable in life mm. than finding the best person um in yeah. the in the, the field in which you are trying to succeed in and having that person um, guide you and teach you and help you get there you know it's uh, I, I just you know nothing has been more valuable for me in my own particular life through mm -hmm. Gary you know I met um, you know many amazing people my best friend and business partner Sam Markowitz in between bouts of uh, uncontrollable laughter. It's, it's incredible. Yeah, actually, Sam is awesome. Yeah. Actually, have the ability to get some work done, but uh, <laughs> you know, I, yeah. I think that uh, Gary has, you know, altered my my uh, you know my destiny in life. And I think mm -hmm. any mentor will reshape you. You know, any good mentor in the area that you're trying to, you know, uh, achieve and emulate is going to reshape you, get you there in the fastest time possible, give you knowledge that would probably be very difficult for you to learn on your own, yeah. multiply the speed of achievement. Um, 
Yeah. So, I mean, and it's not just copywriting. It's not just business. I mean, anything, relationships, you know, uh, health, you know, the idea of, of a mentor is, is very powerful. What lessons have Sam taught you? <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a big, that's a big topic there. Sam is next to my brother, John. I think Sam has probably had the most impact on my life. I've moved to more countries because of him. Mm. I've experienced more crazy things because of him. Um, you know what? I mean, in regards to what life, business, copywriting. I mean, I'm learning from him all the time. Yeah. take your pick. Whatever, whatever sticks out. He seems to be wise beyond his years. That's what I find. He is, yeah. he is wise well beyond his years. Yeah, and yet he's still able to maintain <laughs> a wonderful childlike personality. <laughs> Well, maybe one one life lesson from Sam, and then one marketing business lesson. Um. Okay, you know Sam is a virtuous guy. He he lives, uh, you know, via, you know, positive morals and virtues. Um, I think that he is a very you know uh, good person ethically and morally. There's very few people that I know in my life that you know, focus on morals and, uh, you know, living a good life, being a good person. I think everyone is living life and just kind of life is happening to them. And Sam seems to be one of those people that, has, you know, kind of in control of the person that he wants to be and is, is, is growing in the directions that I think he wants to grow in. And, uh, you know, I find that inspirational. Yeah. I find that motivational. Uh, it's something that I think, you know, the best lessons in life often come uh, through being around people as opposed to um, kind of being told something by mm. a person, you know. So Sam is one of the, in, in that regard, he's one of those people that kind of I get to watch and learn from. Yeah. What did you uh, see? What did you see him do that you're like, holy cow, this guy is one of the best people or moral person or whatever, whatever <laughs> words. Yeah, you know, I, I, I don't like, again, I don't have these specific yeah. examples. I mean, I, I just know him as a person, you know. I mean, we've been friends for so long. We've, yeah. we've, uh, we lived, we've lived together. We've hung out together. We've, you know, I, I just know him as a person. I know what he's yeah. doing. I know what he's up to. I know what he's, the direction he wants to go in life. I know that through countless hours of conversation um, with him that, uh, you know, He's, he's just a, a moral person. He's just, mm -hmm. he's, you know, he's that type of guy. In business. Uh, yeah, what key advice has he given you in business? Um, key advice, you know, I don't know. I mean, we work together all the time, so I don't know. I guess not one key advice. I don't know. The, the, the concept, he's very big on framing, and I think mm. that that's, that's something that flew under the radar with me as it relates, like I understand framing as it relates to copywriting. Sam takes it into every last <laughs> element of his life. Yeah. And, and, uh, and to see him apply that and for him to, to teach me that stuff, um, the importance of framing and positioning with everything in yeah. life. So what do you mean um, by framing? Framing, you know, I mean, you can, uh, Framing, you know, the idea, like there's, there's always a, a way of best positioning yourself or others, you know, um, you know, you could, you could, you could say, hey, you know, you've got this, you're talking to your friend and you're like, hey, you know what, I, I met this guy, Caleb, he's a terrible person, you know, <laughs> um, that would be one frame and another frame would be like, hey, you know what, I met this guy, Caleb, and he's really cool and he's a nice person, that's another frame. Right, right. So, you know, taking the time to uh, understand that there is always a way of, of positioning um, gotcha. yourself in better ways, positioning you know, the people around you in, other, in better ways, um, you know, doing, you know, positioning deals so that they're more rewarding for each and every person involved. Mm. Um, so many things, man. I yeah. mean, so many, yeah. <laughs> so many different ways in which that is applied. I mean, it's and, and in your personal life, you know, it's not just it's not just business, and uh, you know, it's 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 a it's a concept for life. I think a very very valuable concept for life. 
many ways that things can happen and you can be in control of, of how they should happen best. Um, so Sam is the type of person that, that puts careful thought into yeah. how to position everything. Yeah. Caleb, this has be you know, has been extremely amazing and valuable and I know you probably have Russian special forces training to go to for two hours, yeah. but um, thank you so much, you know, Caleb, I really appreciate it. Thank you, Jeremy. This was a. Uh, it was great talking to you. Yeah. Always great talking to you, and uh, I appreciate the time. Yes, thanks, Caleb. Today, listen. Take care. Thank you very much. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.